dear all it's a privilege to welcome you for another uh, pulse lecture on update of covid uh, omicron variant of covid during these trying times this is as a part initiative is as a part of training desk of the covid command uh, center in uh, cmc vallo the moderator for today's session is professor osi abraham and i'm sure you can identify many of the eminent speakers in the panel uh, for today uh there is a chat box for you to put up your questions and we would take the questions at the end of the session and there is a youtube link to access this videos later over to professor of uh, oci abraham thank you very much abhi <clears throat> uh, good evening friends uh it's my privilege to moderate this session on uh, omicron variant of uh, sars coronavirus 2 Uh, it was in december 2019 that investigators reported a cluster of cases of unusual pneumonia in wuhan in china pretty soon the causal agent was discovered it was a novel coronavirus subsequently named as sars coronavirus 2 the two words i want to emphasize are unusual pneumonia and a novel coronavirus because this was new to the whole world in the last two years uh, scientific knowledge about this pathogen <clears throat> and the manifestations epidemiology diagnostic prevention drug treatment has seen advances yet uh, unprecedented unprecedented in the field of medicine but every time uh, i also uh, am aware of the fact that there is still a lot to know uh, a lot of known unknowns and unknown unknowns uh, we know that uh, rna viruses mutate we are very familiar with the uh, phenomenon of uh, antigenic drift in influenza virus and the seasonal outbreaks but every time a new variant of sars corona virus 2 has surfaced uh, i would say there has been panic all around the world will it affect our diagnostics will it cause more milder disease or more severe disease uh, will it have any impact on therapeutics a vaccination strategy so to answer all these questions we have a panel of eminent speakers dr mahesh murthy from virology christian medical college vellore will speak on diagnostics uh, dr georgem vargis who is a professor and head of infectious diseases will speak on therapeutics and uh, uh, beloved teacher uh, professor t jacob john uh, former head of virology department will speak on public health response to omicron variant and finally Dr. Gagandeep Kang will speak on uh, impact of vaccination and uh, monoclonal antibody treatment for the current variant. So uh, I will pass it on to uh, Mahesh to start off the procedures. Uh, Abhi, shall we do the presentations one after each and uh, then uh, take the questions in the end? Is that okay? Yes, sir. Mahesh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rossi, and uh, so. Pleasure to be here and I look forward to talking about the impact of diagnostics. I'd like to share my screen. I was asked to give this lecture or this little talk on uh, the impact of diagnostics on the Omicron variant. And uh, as you may all be familiar, we are already reaching the part where the wave is picking is picking up and. Uh, we'd like to know if our diagnostics are better and also in terms of whether clinical illness is less severe and so on because there's a lot of literature that's coming out so i i'll very quickly go go through a little bit of an introduction about coronaviruses and uh, then move on to a little bit about diagnostics and how specifically it impacts or does not impact uh, the presence of uh, detection of corona of uh, omicron so uh, coronaviruses are a zoonotic uh, family of viruses they cause zoonotic disease and there's a very diverse animal animal reservoir in bats in a uh, lot of wild animals uh, in addition there are in addition to the hosts being diverse there is also a very large diversity of within this family uh, coronavirus uh, there's uh, different the diversity is so wide and it's unknown a lot of it is unknown because of the fact that we don't have enough surveillance but we do know a fair deal now about sars cov2 but uh, 
we have known previously about uh, the seasonal coronaviruses and uh, the two other epidemic coronaviruses that have infected humans. So uh, the seven pathogenic species as such are the four seasonal coronaviruses, OC43, 229E, NL63, HKU1. And uh, the uh, epidemic ones are the original SARS-CoV-1, SARS -CoV MERS, and now we have the SARS-CoV-2. The pathogenic viruses belong to the genus alpha coronavirus within this family, alpha and beta. And beta is the one that has caused all of the epidemic viruses. Now, on to SARS-CoV-2, it's everybody knows enough about it now. It's a 29 KB virus, RNA virus. It tends to mutate. That's why we are here. We're talking about uh, a variant. Uh, has a whole range of proteins, the spike, the membrane, envelope, and the RDRP. Uh, it's important to note that uh, there are some particular genes or some particular uh, proteins, genes and, and which code for proteins that are more prone to more mutations and they are the focus of a lot of, uh, they, they have generated a lot of interest because of the fact that vaccines are directed towards these proteins and one of them is these uh, spike protein. In addition, you must remember that it is variable across the board and it's not just in the spike but all, all over. So why exactly are we trying to why exactly do we need to study SARS CoV 2? That, that, that icon is not coming. No, no, no. You just take out the examples. We, so, so, at the beginning of the 2020 pandemic, at the beginning, there was a very rapid dissemination of protocols for sequencing of these viruses. And very quickly, almost in real time, we were able to track the changes that were occurring in this virus. And now we are able to quite accurately quantify what changes are happening where and where exactly it came from and what the origin was and what the dates of its origin were. So we, we want to study these sequences because, you know, we want to know where they came from. Is there some kind of, uh, can we estimate from, for example, on a country specific level, or we want to look at whether how, how well or poorly it is spreading in a population. And is there something that's in the sequence or, or certain mutations that are affecting the way that it spreads? Is it geographically restricted? Are there certain lineages that restrict to a particular region? And also, because we are cataloging these mutations, we'd like to know what effects they have. We are seeing the clinical cases, but we'd also like to know in experimental uh, in a, with an experimental setup to see what effect these mutations have on uh, different aspects. Basically, we're trying to look at the phenotype. So far, we've seen, and because we have been tracking it almost real time, we've seen the way it has evolved from the original founder strain to uh, uh, different, different variants. One of them was the uh, D614G, and then now it has now further changed into multiple variants and they're now classified uh, quite elegantly. So we know they mutate, we know they have been mutating and, and of course we know for RNA viruses that they do mutate all the time. And we are now more concerned with what specifically drives mutation and what is it that's causing these viruses to mutate. Now it's been described from for close to two or three, two and a half decades, that virus specific immunity is what drives the selection of variants and therefore causes the an, a rapidly evolving pathogen to change. In the case of uh, COVID, you can have it can be due to infection or vaccination or in, vaccination plus infection. So this basically will try to will um, cause a uh, much higher uh, it will cause the virus to change much more than it would have normally because there is, it's, it's forced to change. In addition, when you have rapid transmission everywhere, you have prolonged, uh, you have high virus loads and these, the fact that uh, an actively replicating virus is present at very high levels automatically means that there will be a certain degree of mutations that occur. So the higher the virus load, the more chance that there will be mutants generated. And that's purely by virtue of 
the uh, replication as such being uh, partly error prone. Okay? When you have prolonged virus shedding, so you have the opportunity for the virus to replicate many more cycles than they would normally have if it was a short uh, duration of infection or a short uh, duration of replication. So you have much longer shedding and then there's a chance that mutations will occur. The uh, another method that these coronaviruses use is a process called recombination whereby you know two different variants or two different strains are able to change strands and then they become a new strand which has different phenotype and therefore they, they it leads to the emergence of a, of a newer variant where they are replicating also determines where whether there will be more uh, heterogeneity there's there's lesser variation and lesser uh, level of mutation seen in the upper respiratory tract as opposed to the lower respiratory tract and we know that the lower respiratory tract there are different compartments as such and it's been shown for influenza viruses and, and it's now also being seen with SARS-CoV-2 the single nucleotide variants that occur within a host okay when you have within the host itself there's variation occurring due to uh, either due to high, higher virus load or due to longer virus shedding, you will have a, a, a potential for this to spread in the population. And that this has been shown. But whatever it is, when you have a hybrid immunity, which is infection plus vaccination, the, the effect of vaccination is so strong that it is able to, uh, the increased breadth of protection also protects against newer variants and variants that are, that may, may not even have emerged. So because we have so many variants emerging, there are different classifications or different ways that they were named. Initially, there was uh, the Gisade classification, which was just using letters and just causing a lot of confusion because a lot of sequences were being generated and uh, we didn't know what to do because there was a lot of variation and people were detecting a lot of variation. The next strain is another system of nomenclature where it's denoted by a year and an alphabet. But the current system that's being used is the pangolin system, which, which uh, basically divides, uh, divides it based on epidemic spread. And so there's a hierarchical, uh, it depends on how viruses are related to each other. And if they form uh, sister clades from, from an original ancestor, they tend to be numbered the same and so on. So the numbering system goes on in the form of a letter followed by numbers with up to three numbers allowed and then after that it switches to another uh, alphabet altogether so in the example of uh, b 1.1.1 and so on the who system has uh, greek symbols that they're using uh, the alpha delta and the omicron now so what are these variants of concern or variants of interest as they're called. So variants of interest are those that have properties that need further, that warrant further investigation, which may be due to either they have a property of transmissibility, they're more transmissible, more severe. They can, they have markers that may reduce neutralization and they may affect the diagnostic test. Variants of concern are those that have been confirmed to have these properties and uh, variants of high consequence are ones that uh, haven't, we haven't seen them yet, but they have significant impact, uh, much higher in severity and uh, vaccines are ineffective as well as treatments. Okay, so we have a whole range of variants that have emerged. The more dominant ones were alpha, beta and gamma, and then more recently delta. And now we have the Omicron that's spreading. All of the others were not very dominant in the sense that they did not spread globally. They were either restricted or they did not uh, grow to such high levels that they became the dominant strain. So the Omicron, line, Omicron variant is uh, called, uh, it's the WHO nomenclature and it belongs to the uh, Pango lineage 21M. So 21M is actually quite old. It's a little older than uh, what is, uh, so it, it probably was circulating somewhere in the range of July to August of uh, 2021. And from then, from there, it has now emerged that the 
21K and L have emerged. Okay, so this the these this Omicron was found to have emerged in South Africa and it has since spread globally. The feature of, of Omicron is that it has a very large number of mutations, more than what we have seen in any of the other variants. And you, as, as, as you can see, there's like a huge catalog of mutations in the spike nucleoprotein and the envelope as well as the matrix. Now, this particular constellation of mutations is not unique only to Omicron. There have been other variants that have shown certain mutations and, and that's, that's a benefit because we've been tracking these earlier variants. So we know potentially what effects those mutations can have. But in addition, there are further many newer mutations and we are not sure if, how it's going to contribute, whether there is going to be a increased transmissibility or severity and so on. So that, that was the reason that they, this was labeled as a variant of concern. So the, there are two kind of sub lineages of Omicron 21K and 21L, also called BA1 and BA2. So they have very similar mutations, but they're also, they also have some different mutations and therefore uh, both of them are considered under the Omicron umbrella. So as I was telling you that there, there are common mutations between, common mutations uh, seen between all of the variants of concern. Okay, as, you, as you can see, Omicron 20, 21K and 21L have a much larger repertoire of variants. Okay. So having told you a little bit about variants and what they are and what kind of mutations there are, uh, I, I would like to tell you a little bit about the real-time PCR assays, which form the mains which form the mainstay of uh, diagnosis for real for uh, SARS-CoV-2. So, right at the beginning, there were many there were many assays that were developed, and uh, these assays were very quickly standardized. And we found that they they actually performed fairly well. They had they were highly specific, quite sensitive as well. Uh, the Advantage and is that these assays that were developed did not target one particular region and they targeted multiple regions of the genome. So, for example, the original WHO assay, the Corman assay, targeted the envelope as well as the RDRP. So, basically, we're trying to look at two targets, and if both are positive, a, a, a patient was considered to be positive. Likewise, in, a, in addition, many other assays were developed the, uh, from. Uh, HKU, the China CDC, all of these depended on picking up more than one target, which was spread across the genome, it, it, either in the ORF1, 1A, or ORF1, AB, or in the, in the envelope or the N. There were very few in the spike, but uh, we did find later that when commercial assays came up, the spike protein also was being used to used for detection and that was uh, being used as an assay for detection of cases. So real-time PCR assays as such are fairly sensitive, but there is an issue that they can have uh, some degree of uh, false negativity. Okay? False negativity is a concern. It depends on, on many things. It depends on how it, the timing of the sample and depends on whether uh, the sample was collected properly. But in addition, you can also have false negativity because of mutations. Now, uh, we had talked a little bit about variants of concern, and I told you about all of these lists of catalog of mutations. So what does a mutation actually do, or what could it potentially do to a PCR? It would, so PCR is based on, on detecting a particular region of a pathogen and it involves using primers and fluorescent labeled probes in the case of real-time PCR. So when there is a mutation, there's uh, the primers that are present do not bind to the virus or do not bind to the template and therefore no amplification can occur. So when amplification, when amplification doesn't occur, you find that uh, uh, there will be no signal. Another, way that you can have uh, 
a failure or a false negative is when you have mutations that prevent the probe from binding. So when that probe doesn't bind, so there is no fluorescence that occurs and therefore it becomes like a false, false, a false negative. Okay, so uh, I want, want to just highlight here about the so-called gene dropout or the S gene target failure. So this was used initially when the alpha variant came up where uh, a particular marker was being used. It was called a marker because the uh, one assay, the TACPATH assay, was, which was targeting three different genes, found that it was the, the binding site of the primer was in one of the regions where of the spike protein where there was actually a deletion and, and that was a catalog, that was a characteristic mutation of the alpha variant. So because of that, the S gene did not pick up as I showed you in my previous slide, the S target didn't pick up. So that was used as a surrogate, as a marker of um, the alpha variant. Now, in the case of Omicron, there is also you must remember that the same variant that's present in alpha is also present in 21K, but you must remember that there's also a 21L. So what it could be that uh, you, you cannot discount the fact that if you have a, a S gene that this is not an Omicron, or if you have an S gene, or uh, uh, if the S gene dropout is there, it's only due to 21K. So what you must understand is that when you have dropouts, you can have dropouts for any PCR assay and not just the S gene. So very often, and we've seen in our experience that you tend to have dropouts, meaning that the, the, the particular gene does not pick up, but we have other ways of confirming where we use additional assays to, to then confirm the reactivity. But the S gene target failure can only be used as a marker when there is when it's specifically tested for in a particular kit. Okay, so as this, this uh, presentation was about uh, whether diagnostics are affected, I did a quick uh, primer binding to check and see if the ancestral strain and the Omicron from India, which was uh, sequenced in the end of December last year. So if you take a quick look at this picture, you would actually see that uh, all of the primers, and I refer to the primers that I described initially, which is the uh, WHO, the HKU, and, and uh, the CDC primers, all of them bind fairly well to both the ancestral as well as the Omicron strain. But you, the problem is only with the E and the RDRP strain, and you can find here, and if you can take a closer look at this picture, you would actually see there's mismatches occurring. So the mismatches are occurring both in the ancestral strain as well as in the, uh, uh, the, the Omicron strain. Funnily enough, there is also a problem with the CDC N1 assay. So the N1 assay, there is a probe mismatch. There is one particular, there's two particular uh, sites which do not bind. So there's potential cause that the CDC assay might fail, but uh, it, we must remember that it, it doesn't require just uh, one mutation for an assay to fail. It may lead to a reduced sensitivity, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the assay will fail. So the commercial assays that are available and uh, from C at CMC, we use the Altona Realstar and those assays have not been affected by the Omicron in the sense that they, they will pick up Omicron. And, and we are seeing now that both genes are usually getting picked up uh, fairly consistently. The other options for diagnosis are the cartridge-based assays, the gene expert, and even these are not affected by Omicron. And the N2 assay, which is closer to the CDC assay, is, uh, is, is conserved. So therefore, it, it also will pick up. And we have evidence now that it will work. The FDA now actually recommends that generally most assays, unless explicitly tested for, most of them are not affected. There, there may be a reduction in sensitivity. Uh, if one, the, uh, there may be a, if one gene is dropped out, there may be a slight reduction, but if you have additional targets, overall the sensitivity tends to remain the same if you have more than two targets. It's suggested to avoid uh, isothermal amplification kits like the Abbott uh, uh, ID now asset. Okay, so another method for detection of uh, 
of uh, SARS-CoV-2 is uh, the use of antigens, antigen detection kits. Now, antigen detection kits are really useful because they have they're fairly inexpensive and they can be done really quickly and the result comes within 15 to 30 minutes. The only problem is that they have a poor sensitivity and, and, and an all right specificity, but they have utility in, in, in the fact that you can actually use it when there is a suspected outbreak and it, it can be used to detect cases early. It can be used to track asymptomatic contacts and also when there is a high risk contact you can have frequent testing and when you do frequent testing you would actually be able to detect cases early and therefore even even though the sensitivity as such is lesser than that for a pcr you would be able to detect these cases earlier by using just frequent rapid detection devices okay so i'll, I'll quickly go through the algorithm that we follow in cmc and uh, so we have basically two two assays that we use for, for diagnosis. One is the Altona real-time Altona real star kit, which detects the E and the S gene, and the Cepheid cartridge-based assay, which detects the E and the N2 gene. Now, when we have two targets positive with the primary assay, will be either of Altona or Cepheid. We automatically report the, uh, the result as positive. But in the case of only one target being positive, we go ahead and do an internal testing with the second assay, which was not used for the primary testing. And we take a composite of all of the results of both the primary and the secondary assay. If there are at least two targets detected, then it's declared as positive. And likewise, if they are negative, then they uh, it's reported as negative. You must remember that there is something called as an internal control and internal control kind of is a check on whether the sample is adequate. So actually there's a bit of a typo here. It actually means repeat sample, repeat. Okay, so uh, that's the algorithm that we have been following at, at CMC and we have uh, been able to, the, the, the number of indeterminate samples of those where we don't know the result is very, very few in all of our testing over the last two years. Okay, so I'll just end with uh, CMC statistics. So over the last two years, we've been testing about 140,000 samples. As you can very clearly see, there are distinct waves of positivity occurring. The first wave, which began in June and ended by December or Jan. Then the second wave, which began in April and July of 2021. And what's looking now like a third wave is just five days of data. So it's actually gone up uh, really high to about 40% now. Uh, we initially thought, so this, this is the detection of all of the positives that we've had. And it, it has nothing to do with clinical presentation, but it's just the overall detection that we have seen over the last uh, two years. Now, we initially thought that in wave one, there would be you know, we thought children were generally spared, but it was not the case. There were fairly, uh, there were quite a few cases among children as well. And the second wave also, it spread uniformly across both all age groups. The third wave, the children seems seem to be very low, but it, if we don't know, it may just pick up. Uh, so I'm gonna end there with, with uh, a summary on what, uh, Omicron means for diagnostics. So we have we are currently seeing a lot of transmission in India, but not all of it is Omicron because it's not being confirmed because the only way you can actually specifically confirm is by sequencing. The numbers are really too high. Uh, you have to remember that diagnostics are not compromised at this point in time. So whatever diagnostics have been in place are good enough and should detect Omicron unless the rider being that they are one of the so-called kits that are known to fail. Uh, by using two different testing systems where dif different areas of the genome are targeted, we tend to have a fairly high accuracy. Antigen de kits detect the Omicron, but they seem to have a lowered sensitivity. Uh, the important thing is we, we know that variants are not going to stop. It's probably going to go on for some time. So the need for vigilance and ensuring that proper quality control is in place so that we are able to, uh, do, to make necessary changes for future variants. I will stop there and 
hand over to Dr. Osi. We will continue. Uh, next presentation is by Dr. George M. Varghese, uh, Professor and Head of Department of Infectious Diseases. And uh, George will be talking on uh, treatment. Uh, do we have to do anything different for this current variant? Over to you, George. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Osi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our third wave started about 10 days ago, and it's been prone variant. Therefore, we should know what to expect and how to prepare for the for the uh, the the wave. Secondly, we I'll talk about some of the insights we have already uh, available on the clinical data, and finally. Uh, there are a lot of evidences which um, are new in terms of uh, uh, clinical management, and I would provide a summary of those uh, 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 changes, and um, uh, I'll sum up with uh, how do we strategize our clinical management. As you know, there's the doubling time has been around two days in the past one week uh, in India. This has been quite similar, both in South Africa and elsewhere, uh, a doubling of uh, number of cases. Uh, the, uh, the, the wave, the epidemic curve has been steeper. Uh, the rise is uh, quite steep, and therefore you expect a rapid fall compared to the previous wave. Uh, we when we had about three months of uh, second wave, this is expected to last about one and a half months or so. We know that wherever we are doing genomic surveillance, particularly uh, in Delhi and uh, in Mumbai in our country, 80% are Omicron variant what is currently circulating. Every country's epidemic curve is unique, and therefore we cannot extrapolate what exactly happens uh, elsewhere, but we need to have our own insight, uh, what are we seeing, and therefore what should we prepare for. This is primarily because, as you know, the, the basic reproduction number or the R0, uh, for COVID, it has been around two point, I mean, two to three, in the earlier wave, it was noted to be around 2.3. In the current wave, it's noted um, as about 2.6. So it's roughly uh, about um, you know, two to three cases will occur from an infected person. And we know that the, the R0 depends on three main factors, the contact rate, which there is a lot of variability uh, in a country like ours, where uh, it is quite uh, thickly populated uh, and there is overcrowding, uh, the contract, contact rates are higher, uh, the R0 will vary. Uh, we saw that with the first lockdown, strict lockdown, it was flattened and therefore a lot depends on the contact rate. And we also know that uh, the susceptible population will change and therefore that again will affect the R0, um, uh, both the duration of infectiousness, um, uh, the mode of transmission doesn't change, but the transmissibility uh, can change, particularly in this virus, we know that uh, the transmissibility is uh, higher. The currently susceptible population, if we have some idea, it will give uh, better understanding of what to expect. And this insight actually uh, we have from one of the recent studies um, uh, which we had done and uh, published recently. We did a zero survey in Valor districts. Uh, so we did this at two different time points. Uh, at the end of wave one, January, 2021, and at the end of wave two uh, in July, uh, 2021. And at the end of wave one, what we saw was the, uh, the seroprevalence was around 28%. Of course, that time there was no vaccination. 
Uh, it, this was quite uh, similar to what ICMR uh, uh, survey showed from across the country, which was around 25%. Therefore, we had uh, three quarter of uh, people susceptible and we were uh, caught um, you know, unexpected with the second wave. Um, and uh, we had at the end of uh, second wave, uh, about 70% zero positivity in Vellore district. We also found that the, uh, among the subpopulations, uh, the urban slum population had the highest zero positivity. That uh, is actually the, uh, the surrogate for, uh, or the proxy for overcrowding. Major zero, uh, zero positive, uh, I mean, majority of the zero positive individuals, more than 75% did not report any symptoms three months prior to uh, the sampling, which means that there has been huge amount of asymptomatic transmission in the, uh, in the community. Um, at the, in July, by July, 2021, we know that the vaccination rate has not been uh, very, uh, has not been uh, uh, adequate at all, um, particularly in the uh, urban slum and in the rural population. The vaccination uptake was less than ten percent. Therefore, uh, the high risk individuals in those unreached uh, a subsection of the community again we may have. Uh, you know, more problems uh, uh, coming up. What about the transmissibility of Omicron variant? This is data from South Africa. We know that the Omicron variant is uh, uh, much more transmissible uh, compared to Delta and other variants. You can see that um, in South Africa, the, uh, the doubling time uh, was around 1.6 to 2 percent, uh, 2 1.6 to 2 days um, uh, of doubling of cases, and that is um, what we are seeing as well. The good news is this is the epidemic curve from South Africa. The fourth wave of South Africa was driven by Omicron variant. You can see the the uh, bottom the uh, red line which is actually the death rate. With every spike uh, or every wave, there was increased spike of deaths. However, uh, during the fourth wave, there has not been a significant rise in the death rate. Again, telling you that this is uh, probably a milder disease. Data from South Africa, again, about the severity of disease. Uh, this is just uh, recently published in JAMA on the 30th of December, where uh, this is from a large um, a chain of private hospitals, patients who are admitted, and therefore the data uh, may not be completely generalizable, but they noticed uh, that it, the, uh, uh, the uh, disease is much less severe. You can see the patients requiring oxygenation is much less uh, 17% versus uh, Delta, which required 74%, um, uh, uh, and also the ICU admission, ventilation, mortality, et cetera. Again, telling you that um, the it is what we uh, are likely to see is much uh, milder disease. And there is, I uh, uh, believe that uh, there is a lot of contribution by the uh, the uh, seroprevalence in the community. When they did this particular study, the vaccination rate in South Africa was only about 24 or 25%. So whatever uh, they had uh, was with the natural infection or majority, uh, I would presume that it is uh, with the natural infection. So when we are looking at the treatment strategies, we should know the natural history of disease, the initial viral replication phase, and then uh, the, the host inflammatory uh, response uh, takes off. And therefore, our treatment strategy at different uh, uh, time points is quite different. 
once you understand this and you plan your treatment strategies, it is much simpler. We know now what are the uh, treatments which work and what uh, don't. And I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. Among all the uh, treatment options which are available, there is a, a, a new understanding about all uh, antivirals when would it be effective and what's the benefit um, um, of one compared to the other? And we, of course, know the benefit of uh, other interventions like corticosteroids and uh, uh, the tocilizumab and uh, um, anticoagulation prophylaxis, etc. cetera. Um, I uh, would like to stress that the both the monoclonal antibodies and the antivirals, uh, their role is much early in the illness rather than later on. Later on, your efficacy uh, or the benefit is going to be marginal, if at all. Uh, and therefore, it is worth looking at some of those data and then planning your strategy. I would primarily concentrate on the new evidence on um, antivirals, what we have. So we know that uh, most of these antivirals, uh, they prevent viral replication. Once the virus enters the cell, uh, there are uh, two particular areas where you can intervene. So the RNA-dependent uh, RNA polymerase, which uh, is an enzyme which is crucial for the, the nucleic acid uh, uh, elongation or the developing the nucleic acid chain. Uh, and there are um, um, inhibitors which act at that stage, both remdesivir and molnupiravir, uh, both these, the nucleotide or the nucleoside analog, uh, which uh, act at this, uh, at this point. We know that there is recent evidence on the window of maximum benefit of uh, remdesivir. I would talk about this. Molnupravir uh, uh, is again a new agent. What is the evidence? I will review the evidence and you can decide where, if at all, there is a role. We also have uh, nirmatrelvir, uh, nirmatrelvir, which is retinavir boosted, is a protease inhibitor. So as you know, the proteins, um, the once the RNA is translated uh, into polypeptides, that has to be cleaved uh, and uh, to be packed uh, to form the new virus. Uh, the protease inhibitors uh, or the protease enzyme act uh, at that uh, point and the protease inhibitors um, act on the uh, uh, the, the uh, protease enzyme uh, at that stage uh, in preventing viral replication. So this uh, is uh, FDA approved, available uh, in the US, but not in India uh, yet. Now, when you see the uh, remdesivir, there has been a lot of doubt. Um, it, you know, the benefit with remdesivir was not very clear. Uh, many people believe that if you give early, um, it would still work. If you give too late, obviously, uh, it is not going to have any role. Once there is a significant inflammatory response, uh, viral uh, replication is very minimal, uh, and that is not the time when this will act. So this new uh, RCT, which was uh, published uh, a couple of weeks ago, was a, a, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, including 562 non-hospitalized patients with COVID-19 with symptoms of less than seven days duration uh, with at least one risk factor for pro progression, which is uh, uh, elderly or other comorbidities versus uh, placebo. The primary endpoint they looked at was the COVID-related re hospitalization or death uh, due to any cause by day 28. You can see the, uh, the endpoint, uh, the uh, main outcome uh, with placebo, 5.3% was the vent rate, 
um, and as compared to that, Remdesivir, the event rate was 0.7% uh, with a significant uh, 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 p-value and uh, uh, hazard ratio, which is uh, very impressive. You can see the kaplan meier curve um, demonstrating that. So again, reiterating um, the role of remdesivir is early. Um, by this trial, the maximum benefit is um, uh, it, it, within seven days of onset of symptoms, that is where it would have the maximum benefit. What about uh, the new agent uh, uh, molnupiravir uh, for non-hospitalized uh, uh, patients? This was a phase three randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. It's a new molecule uh, by Merck, and uh, they had uh, 1,433 non-hospitalized patients with mild to moderate symptoms uh, of less than five days duration and at least one risk factor for progression. Uh, again, the same, very similar elderly um, uh, comorbidities. Um, and uh, here, uh, uh, for some reason, last, large majority of people were obese, and that was one of the major risk factors, and the others were smaller proportions. Uh, they used molnupiravir uh, 800 milligrams twice daily for five days, uh, against a placebo-controlled arm. Uh, now, the primary endpoint they looked at was um, uh, incidence of hospitalization or death by day 28 to 29. Um, and they had um, a, a priori planned and interim analysis. And the, the, the second last bullet is the, uh, the interim analysis, which is what is uh, projected both in the abstract and also uh, in the initial part of the results um, in the main, um, uh, main uh, article. You can see that um, uh, the, uh, the absolute difference of about 6.8%, 7.3 versus 14.1 uh, in the placebo group um, with an absolute difference of 6.8, the P being significant. But surprisingly, when, so this was halfway through. You can see the number of patients are almost half. Um, when they completed the trial uh, with um, uh, you know, total 1,400 odd uh, patients, uh, what they found was the benefit was modest. Uh, now, uh, you can see that the absolute difference is just about uh, 3%. I don't think it is uh, statistically significant, uh, they have not given the P. When you look at the power, it was underpowered. But why did this happen is a bigger question. Uh, now, you can only presume certain things. Number one, uh, the trial was done between May and uh, November 2021 when the cases were actively going up, uh, when there was a lot of uh, transmission occurring in the community. So uh, my, uh, one of my uh, suspicion is that uh, if they are already immune, if they had developed uh, natural immunity, these are all patients who were not vaccinated. They did not include vaccinated individuals. Therefore, natural infection, uh, if uh, by chance occurred um, you know, uh, in the second half, then uh, some of it, uh, the effect uh, size, you will see a decrease. Probably some of those has uh, crept into this uh, and also obesity and uh, some of the other factors. So the, um, uh, the decision is yours. Um, is it uh, something which is very impressive? Uh, certainly not, uh, but uh, there may be something more uh, uh, you may want to look at um, it closely and decide uh, in particular uh, specific settings. This is again the subgroup analysis. You can see that um, uh, the, if they are negative, um, uh, if they are antibody negative, uh, the, uh, it showed a benefit. Um, it, it, some of those um, we need to look at uh, more carefully. Again, the subgroup analysis, they have given 
the data of the interim analysis. Now, the, the third uh, antiviral which, is, uh, which has come out uh, is uh, uh, Nirmatrel, uh, which is retinover boosted uh, or uh, Paxlovid uh, FISA molecule. Uh, this was a phase three double blind placebo controlled trial, including 2,246 non hospitalized patients with mild to moderate COVID 19 with symptoms of less than five days duration um, and at least one risk factor for uh, progression, very similar to the other trials. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the drug versus placebo, the primary endpoint end was very, um, uh, uh, the, the same primary endpoint they looked at. You can see the difference in the placebo arm, the event rate was 6.3%, versus 0.8 percent in the uh, in the uh, treatment arm with an absolute difference of uh, 5.6 uh, uh, percent uh, quite an impressive uh, uh, data uh, and when you look at the subgroup analysis most um, uh, you know subgroup uh, factors which they looked at uh, showed significant difference so this, Full um, article is not available. This is what they had sub, uh, sub, uh, submitted to uh, FDA. And we have the summary from, from there, uh, and which looks quite um, uh, impressive and uh, promising, but the molecule is not available in India. So until we have it, uh, we may not have to uh, make a decision or we may not have to worry about it now. Strategies for optimizing clinical care. What do we need to do now? First of all, we need to have a strict admission criteria. Otherwise, uh, we know that one third of our population is still susceptible. Uh, there will be large number of cases. Um, the uh, healthcare facilities uh, overloading could be an issue. We need to have strict admission criteria. Assessing disease severity, risk factors, and considering the duration of illness to make a treatment plan. Uh, and uh, this is what one should uh, do. Of course, the identifying the high-risk group, it is uh, nothing new, uh, the elderly and the comorbidities. I would just summarize how would I manage uh, uh, the, uh, the COVID-19 cases given the current evidence with old molecules and the new uh, treatments which are available. We know that, um, I mean, let me start with this. It's a busy slide, but uh, you can see uh, in the middle where I have represented the viral replication phase in, the, uh, in green and the inflammation uh, in red, uh, which is actually uh, on both ends of the spectrum and in the middle, you will find the overlap. And the uh, usual duration of symptoms, which I have represented on top, is, a just, is just a rough guideline for us to have an um, uh, 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 idea in our mind, uh, uh, roughly about five days um, uh, in each of the, the segments where will they move uh, in terms of, uh, you know, if the symptoms are progressing, uh, when should we expect the progression of symptoms and so on and so forth. And as you know, the most important clinical parameter which will uh, help you in making the decision is the saturation and the respiratory rate. In the severe spectrum, um, uh, saturation of less than 94 uh, and respiratory rate of more than 30. And uh, the red flag features, irrespective of the duration of symptoms, dyspnea or uh, respiratory rate of more than 30 uh, or saturation less than 95, irrespective of the duration, your antenna should be up. Um, and that's one of the uh, red flag features which you look for. I won't go into the details of chest X-ray um, imaging and also the uh, laboratory parameters, um, but uh, whom will you admit? We will have to follow 
uh, a very strict criteria where uh, you will admit people with um, um, uh, with uh, severe disease and critical illness where uh, the saturation is less than 94 or, uh, or the respiratory rate is more than 30. Um, in the uh, middle, uh, of course, the mild disease, they don't require admission. Uh, in the middle, where you are, it is in between, um, you have to decide based on uh, a case by case basis, you have to decide, do they require admission? Um, and particularly, if they have high, high risk uh, factors, uh, you may uh, need to admit them. So in that category, in mild disease, um, only symptomatic treatment, but if the, there is uh, symptoms persisting beyond three days, um, I would, uh, within people with um, uh, other risk factor for progression, I would probably start off on uh, inhaled butasonide. In the moderate category, um, IV remdesivir is my choice, um, where if it's um, closer to the milder spectrum, probably for three days, if it's closer to uh, severe disease, it will be um, uh, you know, five days, uh, total duration of treatment. Uh, inhaled butasonide, of course, will help. Uh, if they are admitted, uh, prophylactic anticoagulation and consider mon monoclonal antibodies and molnupiravir uh, in outpatient treatment. Uh, select uh, a set of patients you may decide uh, in patients who would benefit. Um, uh, and uh, in the severe category, of course, dexamethasone, there is no uh, ambiguity. Barcetinib, again, uh, good evidence if they are on oxygen therapy, it will help. Uh, remdesivir is questionable, uh, something which is, I mean, anybody with illness less than 10 days, uh, I would still give remdesivir. Um, uh, of course, inoxaparin, prophylactic dose, um, the therapeutic dose, you must be careful uh, particularly in the critically ill group. Um, and uh, tocilizumab, uh, when would I use it? Uh, if they have worsening uh, oxygenation or the hypoxia, uh, in spite of uh, starting on dexamethasone, and if their CRP is more than 75, uh, that's when I would start uh, uh, tocilizumab. And this is how I would summarize uh, my treatment strategy today for the upcoming wave. Uh, so to, to summarize, most cases currently are mild or asymptomatic and therefore no need to panic. However, one third of our population is still susceptible. And therefore, in terms of absolute numbers, uh, even a, a smaller proportion of those, we could have uh, increased demand on the healthcare system. Uh, focus on masking and protecting the vulnerable now, have strict hospitalization policies, identify the, the warning signs, management strategy based on severity and risk factors, and evidence on antiviral efficacy is becoming uh, clear. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Over to Dr. Osi. Thank you very much, George. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, there will be many questions to you, so we'll take them at the end of the, uh, uh, this presentation. Our next presenter is uh, speaker is uh, Professor T. Jacob John. Sir needs no admission, uh, no introduction to any audience in India. A uh, lot of questions on what should be the public health response to this current variant. Uh, it was the fourth wave. So a uh, lot of us are waiting anxiously to hear you your views on it, sir. Over to Professor Jacob John. Okay, the topic given to me is public health response or responses to Omicron. Now, public health response is quite different from healthcare response, as you already know. Our weakness in the country is in designing, applying, and evaluating public health responses. 
be that as it may, let me have the next slide. We have experience with two waves, 2020 and 2021. Don't we already know all public health responses? Of course we do, everyone knows. We are all familiar with uh, all the uh, responses that are required, but fine tuning is necessary for Omicron for three reasons. The agent is variant of concern for the reasons that transmission efficiency is quite high, higher than Delta. Delta was the record holder. And it is a stronger immunity dodging variant than even Delta, again, the, uh, the record holder for dodging immunity. So that is one reason. The second is the context now is epidemic is already started. I will focus on Valor district because we belong to the district and every district and every city has its own epidemic pattern. They all merge together to the national pattern. Despite high population immunity, which is both due to infection and vaccination, epidemic is on. There is a third factor between uh, 2020 and 2021, vaccines are available. In fact, vaccines had been available ahead of the spread of uh, Omicron. This is just a visual on Omicron mutations on the S gene. Now, bottom is Delta, Gamma before the, uh, ahead of that is Beta, earlier than the Alpha and Omicron right on top. The pink portion about the left of the middle is the receptor binding domain, RBD. Look at Delta, two mutations over the, the uh, anti, uh, the, the um, ancestor virus, we can't call it ancestor, the, the founder variant, D614G. Um, gamma had three, beta had three, alpha had one, and look at how many Omicron has. Astounding number. 11 or 12 mutations. The S1 region on the left side, the blue, again, look at the number of mutations crowding that area. So this uh, Omicron's proximate parent remains unknown. It is not Delta, not Gamma, not Beta, not Alpha. It, somewhere along the line, we do not know the parentage. How did this variant mutate and acquire so many mutations? That mystery we will not go into uh, now, but this has resulted in as uh, Mahesh Murthy said, we have to be careful about testing. And as George Vergi said, we have to learn uh, how to fine tune management. The disease seems to be not so severe as in Delta. Uh, that is the reason. The cell entry of the Omicron variant is different from the cell entry process of alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and the original uh, founder variant. I will not go into details, but just to put it in a nutshell, the syncytium formation, the multicellular giant cell formation, which is the characteristic of all the uh, previous variants that results in lung pathology, leading to hypoxemia does not occur with Omicron. Omicron has a different 
cell virus interaction which uh, makes it more of a upper respiratory bronchus and above throat nasal mucosa so these are some differences which have resulted in the new clinical presentation also the first factor that uh, alerts us on the omicron specific public health uh, responses is addressing transmission efficiency and uh, mask is the most important preventive for transmission any mask worn by infected people most of whom will not know they are infected because they are asymptomatic will drastically reduce droplets and reduce transmission but any mask cloth or loose fitting worn by the uninfected people do not prevent virus entry into nostrils so the mask quality is important standards are available from cdc so i will not go into details the mask should minimize free air entry so that the gap should be minimal it should filter the inhalable air to keep the viruses out it should electrostatically retain the virus on masks outside surface next slide please so for hospital campuses the policy you know should be all patients family visitors must wear mask there should be no compromise on that all healthcare personnel must wear masks of quality that is institutional policy demanded and should be a strictly applied this is to prevent infection in the uninfected well uh, healthcare workers are put at increased risk because of repetitive exposure so they should be more careful in wearing masks that will prevent inoculation all other staff who are exposed to patients family or visitors or working in closed spaces must wear mask of cmc prescribed quality and the hospital infection control committee must define mask quality for those areas the role of physical distancing um in this context in today's context is uh, a bit problematic because everybody is well relaxed and uh, nobody uh, seems to follow any physical distancing but within the hospital campus um we have to be a little more strict the efficiency of physical distancing in preventing omicron infection is very questionable omicron will catch almost everybody okay but what should be done is to minimize avoidable gatherings and maximize web based group activities in my opinion hospitals can and must continue fully functional as before next slide please now the second portion is addressing immunity evasion among all variants omicron is the worst dodger of immunity induced either by infection with any variant in the past or with vaccination any vaccine in any country the infection immunity wanes faster than we desire or faster than we had anticipated in general there is a uh, feeling that viral immunity are more solid but you know about influenza this is the worst among viral infections in which the 
infection induced immunity does not la last very long uh, it begins to wane and by 6 months lot of it is gone by 9 months much of it is gone although infection immunity is better than two dose vaccination immunity the vaccine offers the chance to enhance infection immunity what people call hybrid immunity so that is in our hands and two dose vaccination immunity can be topped up with booster vaccination so the height of vaccine immunity or the marker of uh, neutralizing virus antibody titer the height can be manipulated by adjusting schedule interval between doses and the total number of doses when you are pressed for time the number of doses will come to your rescue so booster is a very important step uh in this line next slide please this is a graph showing fall of neutralization titers the reference on the left side is uh, the founder variant d614g and these are convalescent sera a bunch of sera on the uh, both the left side of the graph are the uh, neutralizing titers of that virus d614g and you can read the neutralization titers on the left side logarithmic 10000 1110 the the delta variant has a reduction of a factor of 1.6 very minor reduction that upset a lot of us when delta uh, was known to be an immune evader but look at omicron its reduction is uh, reduced by a factor of 10.6 extremely uh, disturbing but the answer lies here if you increase the titer to 10000 then you will end up with 1000 so that is the reason why booster immunity is critical next slide please there are many many studies and i am not going to uh, quote any of those of the actual protection against hospitalizable disease this is a slide from pfizer people with two shots the omicron protection this is antibody levels again comes down quite uh, dramatically and with one booster it goes right back up 25 times next slide please now i'll come to velour district up to the last week of december we were in an endemic state daily numbers were single digit numbers and from the end of december beginning of january you see what velour district is showing very steep rise and this is seven day rolling averages the vertical line is actually 221 as of yesterday so it's a extremely steep rise um seven day averages will smoothen it a little bit next slide active cases active cases are the ones that will infect others same pattern but the most worrying uh information is next slide all this time there was zero death in velour district due to covid-19 but as the epidemic began growing we had uh, three deaths four four six deaths six deaths six deaths this is a bit unexpected and a bit bothersome uh, we will have to wait 
and get more details about uh, what is causing this death. My guess is that diabetics get severe diabetes, ketoacidosis. Similarly, chronic diseases, the disease is made worse. And that may be what is causing uh, death in people with Omicron, because most likely these are people with severe comorbidities or immune senescence. Next slide. This is my last slide. One question that uh, public health people will ask is, when you roll out vaccines in the community, in the, during an epidemic, um, the old teaching is that when you are in the middle of an epidemic, be careful in giving the vaccine because a lot of people may be infected and if the vaccine can make infection uh, with worse outcome, then you have to withhold the vaccine. I've not seen any information on this question. I guess the dose is so small that it may not cause any problem even in the asymptomatically infected person. The safety of the adenovirus capsid and the DNA transcribed mRNA, that is a result of uh, the adenovirus uh, uh, vectored vaccine, and mRNA that is endogenously made is uh, very pro-inflammatory. So we need to uh, keep that in mind and collect information. Inactivated virus, it's just six microgram, probably quite safe. We don't have the uh, protein subunit vaccines yet available for boosters, but we are hopeful that it may come soon. And so the non-inflammatory kind of vaccines may be quite safe. The others also may be very safe. I do not know, but this is something that we need to answer uh, with uh, all the clinical uh, experience when you count, when you look at cases and uh, investigate them, keep this in mind, uh, whether vaccinated people show up more frequently or not. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> uh, next speaker is uh, Professor Gagandeep Khan. Uh, her topic is uh, vaccination and uh, monoclonal antibodies with reference to the current variant, pandemic caused by the current variant. Uh, Dr. Kang needs no introduction. Uh, probably the sanest voice uh, based in true scientific principles throughout the pandemic. And uh, uh, even before she has began her talk, there have already been questions on vaccination. Uh, so over to you, Cherry. Let's hear from you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, Osi. I will try to be brief so that there is plenty of time for questions. Okay, so we are going to be talking about vaccines and Omicron. And let's start with saying there is data but all the questions that we want to ask cannot be answered based on data at this time. So what are the important questions, particularly around vaccines and Omicron? We want to know the effectiveness of vaccines. Once you've received your primary series with a range of vaccines, you want to know what does the booster dose do? So that's true for infection, that is true for severe disease as well. Then we want to know duration of protection, particularly against severe disease. We want to know whether the vaccines are effective against transmission of Omicron. We want to know whether the dosing intervals between the primary and the boosters make a difference. And we want to know whether prior infection makes a difference or not. As I said, we won't answer all those questions, but we'll try and look at the data that are available for some of them. 
So currently, where are we with Omicron vaccine effectiveness studies? There are a total of nine studies that I know of so far. Most of these studies have looked at the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. The bulk of these studies are from the UK and from South Africa. So I'm not going to walk you through this entire set of tables, and there are three of them, just to show you which are the slides that are covered in this. So as you can see, uh, Denmark has one study, which I will be sharing, which is a, a study that also looked at transmission within households that I think is valuable. Important to remember that many of these studies at this time are only available as preprints, and that means that there may be changes in their interpretation once we get the fully peer-reviewed data out. So these are all of the studies that are available. And if we look at the summary of these studies, what you see here summarized are the studies from the UK, and they are to look at um, what happened with the primary series in the top graph and the booster dose in the bottom graph. If we look at the primary series, then you see that what we are getting is a variation with the various vaccines. Vaccine effectiveness against infection is in general 50% or less. In the case of the AstraZeneca vaccine, you don't see any protection against infection at all. You see slightly better protection against hospitalization, and that is a single study from uh, Nick Andrews and the group at the Health Security Agency in the UK. We will cover that in a little more detail. Now, if you look at booster doses, what happened with booster doses, you can see the boosters are color coded there. And um, you can see that with all of the vaccines, you push up the protection against infection, against disease, and again, particularly against hospitalizations. Now, all of these studies compared Delta to Omicron and Omicron vaccine effectiveness was always lower than Delta. And it's important to remember that vaccine effectiveness for Delta was lower than the vaccine effectiveness for Alpha. Now, to go into a little more detail um, into the main UK study that gives us information on uh, hospitalization as well, this is a test negative case control design among uh, people over 18 years. And this is for a period of approximately four weeks. There are limitations to this study because this was early in the Omicron entry into the UK. And for some of the analyses and some of the vaccines, the numbers were really small. So if you look at the top graph, that is the AstraZeneca data. And if you look at two doses, you see that there is no vaccine efficacy once you reach 20 weeks after full vaccination. And this is compared to 40 to 45% efficacy for the Delta variant. The UK used a booster dose of mRNA vaccine and this increased the vaccine efficacy to 40 to 70%, but with waning over time. Very important to emphasize that these data are for symptomatic infection, and it includes all kinds of symptoms, not just severe disease. If we look at the Pfizer vaccine, the two-dose vaccine efficacy was less than 20% by week 15, that compared to 60 to 80% for Delta. And with the booster dose, which was again mRNA, vaccine efficacy increased to 40 to 80%. And the Pfizer vaccine waned over time, 12 to 14 weeks, 
but the waning was minimal for Moderna. For Moderna, the vaccine efficacy also declined by 15 weeks compared to 80% for Delta. And there was very little data for boosters for people who had received Moderna vaccine because Moderna was introduced into the UK program at a late stage. Now, if we look at hospitalization with Omicron, what the HSA did was to combine all of the vaccines together because they didn't have sufficient numbers within each group that had been hospitalized. And this is the summary table. Essentially, it shows that if you're beyond four weeks and you've only received one dose, then your vaccine efficacy against hospitalization is about 52%, but it's not significant. If you've received two doses and you are 24 or fewer weeks, you have 72% vaccine efficacy against hospitalizations. If, however, you've gone beyond 24 weeks, then the vaccine efficacy against hospitalizations declines to 52%. And if you've received a booster dose and you're uh, two weeks after the booster dose, your vaccine efficacy against hospitalizations goes up to 88%. So these are the data based on which everyone is focusing on the fact that you need to have a booster dose to protect against severe disease, particularly in populations that have the kind of age structure that the UK does. Now, the UK also had studies that looked at the duration of protection, and they looked at the primary series as well as the booster dose. And this was against infection again, and against any disease and against hospitalizations. So what you see here is the same general trend, which is that primary series gives us some protection but that declines with time in about four months. And if you look at vaccine effectiveness against hospitalization, that is generally better, but there is a trend to decreasing vaccine effectiveness over time. When you receive um, a booster dose, then you get better protection against disease and hospitalization, but there as well, you begin to see some level of waning. Now, there are very important caveats to all of this data, as I'm sure you will realize, because these are not vaccines that we have in the country. And the UK is a country that has a very different infection history and a very different age structure from what we have in India. If we look at the data from South Africa, this was from a private healthcare provider, Discovery Health. And they looked at what happened to vaccine effectiveness and they also used a test negative design. Essentially what they showed was that if you, and proxy Omicron just means that they used S gene target failure and not sequencing data to determine um, uh, to determine um, positivity. So if you look at pre-Omicron, they had 93% vaccine effectiveness for hospitalizations. And with Omicron, it became about 70%. So there are limitations because um, there is there was lack of testing early on. And then of course, the fact that Discovery Health is a private healthcare provider. So it's generally people from a higher socioeconomic group that are uh, part of this program. There are other studies that have looked at vaccine effectiveness against hospitalizations. This is comparing people who received two doses of the J&J vaccine. You may remember that the J&J vaccine was supposed to be a single dose vaccine when it was first brought out. 
it is now recommended in the US that anyone who has a J&J receive a second dose of a vaccine. This also used data from Discovery Health. And what it essentially showed was that if you had two doses of uh, the J&J vaccine, you had pretty good protection uh, from the vaccine. Okay, now coming to transmission, there is one study and some of the data from this study, it's still in a preprint. Some of the data from this study is a little bit strange, but essentially what it shows is that if you compare what people who are unvaccinated with people who are boosted, there are people who have been boosted and stay in households where an infection has come in, you have a decrease in transmission of infection to those individuals. Now, there are major limitations to all of this data. They only a few studies, nine, many as preprints. And it's important to remember that early Omicron cases can be different because they might be travelers, belong to different socioeconomic groups, than the general populations. There are also limitations in methodology that we don't have time to go into. And many of these UK data are based on administrative databases. In general, those have provided pretty good information, but the UK is not generalizable to the rest of the world because of the way in which they conduct their testing. Uh, the sample sizes, of course, are small, and it can, especially for Omicron and the data from South Africa, there have been questions, particularly with younger age groups, whether people were being hospitalized because they were infected with Omicron, or the Omicron was detected when the person was uh, being scheduled for hospitalization. So therefore not really contributing to the illness. So all of this will require some work with the data to clarify these issues. Now, moving to neutralization studies. Um, if we look at the vaccines, the first thing that started to be done when we had the Omicron variant identified was to begin to evaluate all of the various vaccines to look at how much reduction in neutralization there was with the Omicron variant. And what you see with the Omicron results is that practically every vaccine, and there are over 20 studies now for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, that there is a 17 to 45 fold reduction in neutralizing antibodies. So over all the studies, there is effectively very little which have delivered results so far. There has been a huge reduction in the neutralizing antibodies that, or the ability of CIRA of people who have received these vaccines to neutralize the Omicron variant. And it's interesting to note that many of the vaccines were, um, that were projected to be very good vaccines, such as the Sputnik, the, you have not been able to find any neutralization at all. Okay, fold reductions in neutralizing antibodies. If you look at booster doses, the picture looks a little better with the booster doses, where you have a smaller fold reduction in the neutralizing ability of CIRA who have received, or CIRA from people who have received booster doses. So the vaccines are listed here in the table. And you can look at the fold reductions and you see that while there is a reduction, it is not as drastic as you saw with people who had only received the primary series of vaccination. Now, moving from 
vaccine sera and neutralizing antibodies. This is data on monoclonal antibodies. What's shown here is the manufacturer, the monoclonal antibodies that they have, and then evaluation of the SARS-CoV-2 variants, Delta and Omicron compared to each other. So the Delta is in the blue or turquoise color and the Omicron is in the red color. So what you can see here is that for most of the monoclonal antibodies that we have, the neutralizing ability of um, those antibodies to Omicron is pretty much lost, except for Sotrovimab, which is the GSK product, and the Adagio product, Adintrevimab, seems to have some activity. There is some also for AstraZeneca's Silgavimab and Evushield. If we look at Ronapriv, which is or uh, Casivirimab and Imdevimab, which are uh, which available in India, then you can see that there is very little neutralized, well, zero neutralizing activity with those commercially available monoclonal antibodies. It's interesting that Sovitrimab was actually developed with a very different strategy from all of the other monoclonal antibodies because GSK went after a site on the spike protein that was most likely to be conserved. And this came from the serum, uh, well, came from uh, a person who had been infected not with SARS-CoV-2, but with SARS-CoV. So in this graph, which is a different study, also doing the same thing, looking to see whether neutralization is maintained. S309 is the original antibody based on which so to, uh, the GSK product was developed. And you can see that the Regeneron and the Eli Lili antibodies don't really do anything. So to summarize, there is very limited data available still. If we look at neutralization, most commercially available monoclonal antibodies do not neutralize, but the GSK product not available in India does seem to. If we look at vaccine studies, it appears that we get improved neutralization with the booster dose, but that's still lower than Delta. And if we look at vaccine effectiveness, all vaccine e effectiveness estimates for Omicron are lower than for Delta. So there are, of course, caveats with all of these studies. So I will stop there and thank you for your attention. So uh, thank you to all the speakers uh, trying to clear uh, some of the fog around the pandemic. Uh, so now is the time for questions. Uh, Abhi, do you have any time limit? Uh, Abhi or Thomas? Uh, so, uh, 15 to 20 minutes, sir. There are quite sure. a few questions, yes. Sure. Okay. I'll start with uh, Mahesh. The first question is to Mahesh. Uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 has a non-structural protein for 14 exon, a proofreading enzyme. Then why do you have so many errors or mutations which occur? So the, the question was that what does seem to have proofreading activity, but why do we still have mutations now? When you say proofreading, it's not an absolute. It doesn't mean that uh, it will correct all the errors. It's not like eukaryotes. It's not like uh, the host genome. So you will have some degree of error in that proofreading itself. Okay? So the reason why there are so many mutations is the, the key factor here is the fact that there are so many patients who have a very, very high virus load. Okay? So when you have a high virus load and a fairly 
I would not call it bad proofreading, but there is some degree of proofreading. But then the problem is that there is far too many, too much of a virus load. So therefore, you end up having mutations and that accumulates over time. And we've seen that these mutations are uh, uh, being selected and they are getting fixed in the population. It means that this is basically you need to look at it as a whole lot of variants that are being produced, a whole lot of variation. And some of them have some distinct advantage and they get fixed. So uh, it's, it's obvious that it's probably the high epidemic transmission that's contributing to this. Okay, thanks, uh, Mahesh. Next question is also to Mahesh. Uh, how to suspect uh, Omicron in the PCR report as they don't have an S gene report? Okay, so you, you cannot use a PCR to detect Omicron because it's based, it is, it is detected based on a specific constellation of mutations and it could just be Delta if you, if you uh, look at the PCR report, because that's what the, the virus that was circulating earlier. For confirmation, do not go with the PCR, go with sequencing. You have to sequence at least the spike and the end where the majority of the mutations are. So, Okay, uh, you said in your slide that you should not do isothermal assays. Any particular reason? Okay, so the, uh, you, you know the problem with, with the whole mutation thing is that when you have a mutation and that particular primer that you're using is not going to work, right? What happens here is uh, with isothermal amplification, you're still looking at one particular target. Though you use a, use a whole lot of primers and many, many things, it's still one particular target. So if that particular target that you're looking at has mutations, then you're stuck. So you don't have anything else because if you have evasion to that particular PCR, that, that particular region, your assay will give a false negative. Okay, last question. Uh, we'll come back to you. To you, Mahesh, again, is uh, uh, if you want to do a whole genome sequencing uh, looking for Omicron, where, do, where can you send your sample in Tamil Nadu? The Department of Public Health, but it has to be regulated in the, there has to be the, the government chain, whichever is the government lab that is doing the testing in that region will have to liaise with the Department of Public Health to send it. Okay, thanks Mahesh, we'll come back to uh, George, you're next. Uh, so first question is on molnupiravir, uh, role of molnupiravir in the third wave and the contraindications and side effects. Well, um, Bolina Prever, uh, the, um, the role, as you saw, the efficacy, there are some questions, uh, meaning the uh, absolute uh, reduction is only about uh, 3%, which may not even be statistically significant. So I would say that we should use it with caution, meaning uh, it may have some efficacy, so don't put all your money on it. Um, and what are the other concerns, including uh, side effects and all that? Uh, one of the thing is that it might um, uh, kick off new mutations and therefore cause a problem, which um, I uh, think it is, I mean, there are some scientific basis, but uh, people believe that that may not become a, a major issue. But there are uh, episodes of uh, uh, giddiness and things like that, which are reported. Uh, no major side effects, uh, which are which we need to worry about. George, will you please comment on the teratogenic potential of Olnupiravir? You said in pregnancy. Yes, yes uh, you will be careful uh, in somebody who is, uh, uh, you know, uh, planning to conceive in that uh, short period of time. Thanks, George. So next is the uh, role of monoclonal antibodies in Omicron. Uh, Cherry had also, assistant, you also made a uh, mention in your presentation. So would you use monoclonal antibodies? If so, which one? And in whom? Is it to, uh, I think uh, Dr. Cherry can take that. I think it's intended for you. <laughs> either, either of you no, I think uh, you I said it uh, with the I, I didn't uh, I didn't uh, review the data uh, 
uh, but uh, Dr. Cherry had uh, clearly reviewed the data. So sotrovimab uh, is likely to have some effect, uh, but may not be all the others. So if at all uh, one would use, that is what I would suggest, but unfortunately it's not available in India. So the, George, the next question is about the study you had published about seroprevalence. The question is that in the slums, did you look for neutralizing antibodies or antibodies against the nuclear capsid protein? And nowhere we looked at neutralizing antibodies. Uh, so uh, it is a, a relevant question, but then uh, we presume that, uh, it, you know, when this is uh, uh, soon after the wave, uh, uh, we uh, presume that proportionately there will be significant uh, neutralizing antibodies after a natural infection. Thanks, George. We'll come back. Next set of questions are to you, sir, uh, Jacob John, sir. Uh, first question is that with more upper respiratory symptoms, that is sneezing and runny nose, how does mask wearing change infectivity for those infected as compared to those with predominantly lower respiratory symptoms, that is cough? Yeah, I mean, uh, these are not uh, well investigated issues, but uh, we already know that people without any known exposure to infected people are getting infected. So, and uh, one very interesting observation in uh, Hong Kong was uh, one room had a Omicron positive person across the aisle, another room who had absolutely no contact. These two had got infected, which means there is a lot of uh, airborne transmission. So now you, and a lot of unknowns. Now, there is one study that shows that if you take salivary swab, uh, which you can take in fairly large quantities, you can keep the swab for 10, 20 seconds in your, and roll around, versus a nasal swab, PCR results are better with the salivary, this is, I'm talking about Omicron, than the nasal. So, there are some differences between the previous uh, variants and the Omicron in terms of how much virus is being shed. Salivary virus concentration means that you don't need to cough or sneeze. And if you're talking, you're continuously letting the virus out. And the more virus that comes out, the wider it might spread. The reason for uh, concentration, first of all, symptoms. Omicron's predominant symptom is sore throat. Hardly any cough. Some stuffiness of nose and runny nose. This, uh, and apparently very little lung infection. With this, we have to construct the dynamics of how virus gets out and uh, how infection uh, is transmitted. And quite surprisingly, as George also showed, the everybody knows that Omicron is far more infectious than even Delta. Um, today, in spite of Delta being widely prevalent in Indian metro cities, uh, 75, 80, 85% are Omicron. Uh, so with all this, we are trying to interpret the how, and we do not know that. We do know that it is a fact. Thank you, sir. So next question is that, would a face shield offer better protection together with N95 masks? Uh, I have not uh, read anything about a face shield adding. Um, any more protection. The face shields, the main function is to protect your eyes. Contentible mucosa is a site in which virus can get deposited. However, if it is airborne, then even the small gaps of the ordinary mask 
between your nostril or your chin seems to be sufficient to put you at risk of infection with Omicron. So face shield, uh, uh, I wouldn't think that it would protect any more than a good mask. The N95 mask uh, is, and there is a, a series of masks like that. They have multiple layers, synthetic material, electrostatic uh, attraction, so virus will not, it will get uh, stuck onto the surface and air is filtered. Um, but N95 has to be quality certified. In other countries, there are quality certification of mask. In India, you know, you can put N95 printed on the mask and the people will think it is N95. So we need to do that. That's why I'm saying the hospital infection control committee in all hospitals must investigate and prescribe the best uh, mask for the healthcare workers. But since salivary virus is too much, any mask will uh, withhold the droplet shedding of virus into the atmosphere. So you cannot insist that everybody wears a N95 mask, all patients and their relatives. But we can insist that everybody should be wearing some mask. Thank you, sir. So next, I suppose, uh, between you and George, you can answer. Uh, how Can you differentiate between cold and Omicron symptoms? Uh, <clears throat> sir or George, one of you can answer. If you have headache, if you have fatigue, if you have uh, body aches and those kind of things, uh, don't look for oxygen falling because Omicron will not have hypoxemia. So at a time when common cold is uh, and sore throats are prevalent, it's going to be tough. But uh, mask wearing has reduced a lot of the other respiratory infections. So today, when in the middle of an epidemic, it's Omicron unless proved otherwise. During the endemic phase, uh, it is more likely to be other respiratory infections than the COVID infection. It's a, okay, that kind of uh, approach. Uh, testing is the only way to distinguish. Okay, sir. Uh, next question is uh, to you, Cherry. Uh, you presented a slide, but then uh, what is the rate of Omicron infection in vaccinated population? <laughs> I am not sure that I understand that question. The if, frequency of breakthrough infections, if you want the, to better. Yeah, the frequency of breakthrough infections is high. So if you look at uh, exposure to Delta versus exposure to Omicron, you're more likely to have infections with Omicron than with Delta. Can I add to that? Cherry showed a slide from the, the UK summary data. A very interesting uh, data. That is, if you had two doses, over a period of time, you lose, I mean, you're looking at people who got admitted with Omicron. Okay. Um, with two doses, you start with about 70% of protection against hospitalized required, hospital admission requiring Omicron. And it drops to about 50% in a matter of, uh, I think, six months or so. So that uh, uh, you get more Omicron infections hospitalized. You give a booster, if I remember right, the protection rate goes up to 88, 90%. Okay, so yes, uh, the breakthrough infections uh, are quite uh, common. I mean, um, the, okay, vaccination breakthrough. Of course, reinfections are also equally common, or not equally, are also very common. Okay, Cherry, the next one to you. Uh, mix and matching of vaccines, data in Indian scenario. Um, the only data we have available currently is the small serendipitous study done by uh, ICMR where people wrongly received Covishield after Covaxin 
that was 20 individuals and ICMR was able to collect data from uh, samples from 18 and has published that information to show that if you give a COVID shield on top of Covaxin, you make more antibodies than you do with two doses of Covaxin. The other study that is uh, available is the study from the Asian Institute of Gastroenterology in Hyderabad. Small numbers, but again, indicating that if you mix doses, Covishield and Covaxin, you get kind of equivalently increased antibodies with a mixed schedule as compared to uh, just Covaxin. Those are the only data that are currently available. Am I not right? The first study was the second dose response. The Hyderabad study is a booster response. Am I right? The second, the first study was heterologous priming. Yeah. And uh, the AIG study is boosting. Shari, the next question is that, uh, is it helpful at all to take the third dose of Covishield as booster, uh, given that India government does not plan to mix vaccines? Um, well, that is currently. You may also notice that in the what was said was that when there are more data, the recommendation may change. And I certainly hope that when there is evidence, we will change along with that. Now, if we take a look at COVID Shield, there's actually data for a third dose from the CovBoost study in the UK where the geometric mean ratio with the third dose, a booster dose of Covishield resulted in a GMR of 3.25. However, they also did um, Novavax equivalent, well, the Novavax vaccine, and they showed that with Novavax, you got an 8.75 GMR increase on a background of two doses of Covishield. Thank you. Uh, next is, uh, is there an immunity risk of T-cell exhaustion slash fatigue with booster dose? There have been a lot of WhatsApp messages. Uh, one uh, screenshot of uh, one table from the Danish study you presented. Oh, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> That study is quite confusing. That's why I chose only one table that made sense. There, so I think it will undergo significant revision once it undergoes peer review. But uh, my basic response to that is trust your immune system. We handle all kinds of antigens all the time and repeat infections, repeat exposures are the norm, not the exception. Uh, when will the results of CMC vaccine trials be available? That's a question you should ask Winsley, who is presumably uh, currently still recruiting patients. He's doing his best. It's been challenging to get all of the arms recruited, and I hope that we will have results in the next six to eight weeks. Next question is about antibody-dependent enhancement and increased risk of infection and adverse outcomes. So far, we have no evidence to show that there is any antibody-dependent enhancement with any of the vaccines that are currently being used. It was considered a concern with some of the inactivated vaccines. It hasn't been shown to happen. Thank you. Uh, very broad question. I suppose all of you can answer it. How do you address vaccine hesitancy in India? I think for me, the first thing is to identify people and places where there is hesitancy. Too frequently, what we call hesitancy is an inadequacy of information. Real hesitancy is where people genuinely think vaccines are dangerous. Most often, it turns out that people just don't know about vaccines or vaccination and don't recognize the value of those. I think for the vaccine hesitant, it is also a spectrum. Some people who uh, are willing to listen and others who are absolutely not willing to listen because this is something that colors everything that they do. 
So at least being able to identify those who might be willing to listen. If you listen to their concerns, and we've done this frequently in our communities, you listen to their concerns and try and figure out why they think that they should not have vaccines and then address those concerns. You know, it cannot be a top-down approach. It has to be communication and communication from people that they trust. So you want to add anything? Addressing vaccine hesitancy uh, is actually a public health activity. And the lack of our a robust public health system in the country has resulted in uh, mm. an absence of authoritative and authenticated data being given uh, with the vaccine adverse reactions properly analyzed so that people get confidence in vaccine. And if you do not build confidence in vaccine, the naturally people listen to all kinds of uh, rumors and messaging, uh, social media messaging. And then if you instill some fear in the mind of a person, then you are likely to be hesitant. It's actually a hugely man-made problem. Okay. Um... Uh, now we are well past six o'clock. Uh, back to you, Abhi. Uh, in case I missed any questions in the chat box uh, and uh, for winding up the session. We have addressed almost all the uh, important ones that have come, sir. Uh, most others are uh, mostly repetition. Um, it's well past time. Thank you so much for all the speakers for sharing your expertise. Thanks, sir, for moderating. Thank you for everyone who attended. Thank you so much. Bye.